Today is Thursday, January 17th. We'll be talking about what two different letters are requesting from the president and how the IRS might give you a break at tax time. Plus, Microsoft's big promise and the new comedy from the makers of the hit show, The Office. Then hang out after the news for a bonus interview. We're talking about why most New Year's resolutions fail by February and how you can actually stick to yours. Welcome, welcome to the Newsworthy. All the day's news in less than 10 minutes. Fast, fair, fun, and on the go. I'm Erica Mandy. Thanks so much for being here. You ready? Let's do this. Another strategy to end the longest government shutdown ever? just failed. Some Democrats and Republicans were circulating a letter that would have asked the president to fund and reopen the government for just three weeks, and in return, they would make sure there's more debate about a border wall or barrier. But it did not work. Politico reports not enough lawmakers were willing to sign it. So in the meantime, CNN says President Trump signed a bill to reassure government workers that they will be reimbursed once the shutdown is over. Also, House Speaker Nancy Pelosi wants the president to put his State of the Union address on hold or just deliver it in writing instead of in person. The reason? She says it's concerns over security, since some members of White House security are on unpaid leave during the shutdown. The New York Times says it's high stakes because the State of the Union address is one of the rare times leaders from all three branches of government will be in the same room. So it needs high security. But Pelosi's critics say this is actually just a power move. And Homeland Security officials said in a tweet they are fully prepared to support and secure the State of the Union address. For now, it is still scheduled for January 29th. Two separate terrorist attacks in two different countries this week killed dozens of people, including some Americans. The latest? In Syria. Reuters reports ISIS claimed responsibility for a bomb attack that killed at least 19 people, including four Americans working for the U.S. military. The attack comes about a month after President Trump said he wants to pull all U.S. troops out of the country. The White House condemned the attack, but The Hill reports some lawmakers criticized the president's plan again, like Republican Senator Lindsey Graham, who said he thinks Trump's statements that ISIS has been defeated and his plan for the U.S. to leave Syria may have actually reinvigorated ISIS. And earlier this week, CNN reports an attack at a hotel in Kenya killed 21 people, including one American. A quick update now. UK Prime Minister Theresa May will stay in power for now. The Guardian reports the government survived that no-confidence vote for the second time. Remember, the UK is leaving the European Union in March. And right now, the UK has not approved a plan that works out all those details. If lawmakers there can't agree on an exit deal, it could mean confusion on issues like trade and immigration. The U.S. government says it'll forgive taxpayers who make certain mistakes at least this year. That's because it's the first time Americans will be filing their taxes under the new tax law. The Wall Street Journal reports there are more relaxed rules now if you did not have enough money taken out of your paychecks for taxes throughout the year. The IRS says the new law sparked a lot of changes, so this is supposed to give you some time to adjust. Tax season starts January 28th. Microsoft is promising to give Seattle half a billion dollars. The goal? Help the communities impacted by big tech. The Seattle area is home to both Microsoft and Amazon. The companies are often blamed for creating a lack of affordable housing, meaning more homelessness. Now, the Seattle Times reports the $500 million will go toward housing options for low- and middle-income workers and says the pledge is the largest in Microsoft's history. Much more news ahead, but a quick moment to tell you about my favorite event of the year and today's sponsor, Podcast Movement. If you have any interest in starting a podcast or maybe you're already super experienced, either way, Podcast Movement is the conference to go to for all things podcasting. In fact, I went to Podcast Movement before I launched the Newsworthy and after I launched, and I've since become a speaker there. Every time I go, I learn so much and I make valuable contacts from big names in the industry to people just starting out. And many continue to be my close friends and support system today. And this year, I'm going again. I would love to connect with you and I'll be planning a meetup at the event for all of us who listen to the Newsworthy to connect. So it's August 13th through 16th, four days of workshops, panels, networking parties, and more. And right now you can use the discount code NEWSWORTHY for $50 off your registration. Go to podcastmovement.com, use the code NEWSWORTHY to get $50 off. Again, that's podcastmovement.com with the code NEWSWORTHY. Now back to the news. 
A new comedy starring Steve Carell is coming to Netflix. And you can imagine it as the show The Office, but in the form of a space force. Yes, The Verge reports it'll be a parody of the sixth branch of the military that President Trump proposed last year. The show is in its early stages for now, so Netflix does not have a release date just yet. And if you do want to learn more about what the real Space Force might do and what needs to happen to start one here in the U.S., it was a Thing to Know Thursday interview back on the episode from June 21st last year. It starts about five minutes into the episode. It seems everyone wants in when it comes to on-demand streaming services, including local news. USA Today reports Sinclair Broadcast Group, that owns local news stations across the U.S., has launched its own TV streaming service called STIR. Mainly, the service is meant to bring news and entertainment to cord cutters. The service will be free, but with ads. It has competition, of course. Fox, NBC, AT&T, Disney, and more have either launched or are planning to launch new streaming services as well. And that's in addition to Netflix, Hulu, and Amazon Prime. Facebook wants to support local news and help make sure it has credible information on its own site in the process. The AP reports Facebook is investing $300 million into the local news industry, providing things like grants to nonprofits and local newsrooms. Facebook says it's part of an effort to fight fake news. Remember the Motorola Razor flip phone from the early 2000s? Well, it might be making a comeback as a smartphone. The Wall Street Journal says the company that owns Motorola plans to bring it back with a foldable screen. It could come out as soon as next month, but it won't be cheap. Reports say the phone will cost $1,500. Coffee lovers, you may want to close your ears for this one. A new study says 60% of coffee species found in the wild could go extinct. The study published in Science Advances says plant disease, climate change, and deforestation are threatening wild coffee like the popular Robusta. The study found some species may die off in the next 60 years or so. And that's it for the main news today, but it's now time for Thing to Know Thursday, where a different expert explains a different thing to know only on Thursdays after the news. This week, we're lightening things up and talking about New Year's resolutions, goals, and productivity. U.S. News & World Report found that 80% of resolutions fail by February. So I wanted to bring on someone who has reached a bunch of his own big goals and is helping others reach theirs every day. John Lee Dumas is the host of the award-winning podcast Entrepreneurs on Fire, where he interviews inspiring entrepreneurs like Tony Robbins and Barbara Corcoran. With more than 2,000 episodes, more than a million downloads a month, and seven figures of annual revenue, John Lee Dumas says he's just getting started. So you've worked with a lot of people. You probably hear from your fans a lot who want to reach their goals, who want to be more productive, but maybe they struggle. So first of all, why do you think people fail at resolutions? People fail at resolutions because they're a human being. It's just a reality. I mean, we all have these great intentions, these great desires, but a lot of times we do come up short because to err is human. It's just the reality. And so I think that's the biggest thing is we just need to accept the fact that we are human beings. We're going to make mistakes. We're going to fail. We're going to struggle. But there's a great opportunity for those people who are willing to go above and beyond with accountability partners, with tools, with resources. They can actually accomplish these goals. They can actually have these resolutions that they see through, but you just can't do it alone. Do you like to set New Year's resolutions? And either way, what has helped you reach the goals that you have, whether it's a New Year's resolution or something else? So I always set New Year's resolutions, but I do it a little bit differently than most people. I'm a big believer in 100-day resolutions, 100-day goals. That's how I operate because I think you can accomplish a lot in three months, but at the same time, it doesn't feel like this overwhelming long period of time. So when people set these one-year resolutions, like for 2019, I am going to do X or Y or Z, by like mid-January, they're like, man, I still have like a long time to go. So that can cause them to either get overwhelmed or to slack off because I think they have a lot of time. But three months, that 100 days, that's kind of like a sweet spot where like the clock is ticking. But guess what? You can still get something really meaningful accomplished in those 100 days. I love that. And it gets you past that February mark with that statistic show most people fall exactly. off. So get to March and it's probably smooth sailing from there. Totally. So something you do really well is productivity. And I think productivity can really be a goal in itself, but also it can help you free up time and energy for the other goals that are important to you. So let's talk a little bit about that. What are a few of your top tips and some of your tools to use to be more productive every day? 
Well, first off, let me just define productivity because I think a lot of people struggle with this. You know, a lot of people at the end of the day, they'll be like, oh my goodness, Erica, I was so busy today. I did so many things today. And then you're like, okay, what'd you do? And they're like, well, you know, now that you talk about it, like, and they can't really come up with anything tangible. When you're being productive, you are producing the right content. That is what you're doing. If you're being productive, you're producing the right content. You're not just liking things on Instagram. You're not just checking your email every five minutes. Like you're actually producing something that's meaningful for you and your business and your life and your loved ones, whatever that might be for you going forward. So that first and foremost, get what productive means. It's critical because so many people just are busy, 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 but they're not producing the right stuff. Now, to go along with that, how can you help yourself when you're trying to be productive? There's something that a lot of people have heard of, but very few people do, and it's called the Pomodoro Method. And that's when you actually sit there and you set a timer for 25 minutes or for 35 minutes. Or for me, I like setting a timer for 42 minutes. It's just what I like to do. And when I see that clock start ticking, I have those 42 minutes where I have to accomplish that one set task that I have. And that makes me cut out all distractions, not be like, oh, well, maybe I'll just go for a quick walk first. No, it's like the clock is ticking. I have 42 minutes. I'm off to the races. I'm going. And it was just as important, Erica, as those 42 minutes of being productive during that Pomodoro Method is the 18 minutes that I give myself what I call to refresh after that focus time. Because that's, hey, 42 minutes of focus, 35 minutes, 25 minutes, however long you're going to do it, that is a strain on the brain. Your brain has to look forward to that relaxing, to that refresh time. Any final thoughts or final takeaway that people should get from this? I feel like the word Parkinson's law needs to come in here at the very end, and that just means tasks will expand to the time allotted. That is so true. If you've ever been to college, you've procrastinated, and then guess what? You crammed on that last day to finish that paper or to study for that exam, and you did just okay, because guess what? That was the time you had left. So that's why the Pomodoro Method works, because of Parkinson's Law. Your tasks will expand to the time that you allot to them, so start allotting a set period of time so you can win at a very high level. And you can go to eofire.com to learn more about John Lee Dumas, his podcast, and the journals he's created to help people reach their goals. I'm also linking to it all in today's show notes on thenewsworthy.com. And as always, that's where you can learn more about any of the stories we talked about in this episode. Go to thenewsworthy.com, click episodes, and find today's date. Thanks so much again for listening. The Newsworthy is ready for you by four in the morning every weekday. So we'll chat again tomorrow. Have a great day.